Thanks a lot, Troy. And thanks everyone for being here. This is really amazing gathering of people and important, um, important things to talk about. My talk is about connections. Connections that involve all of us. Connections that sooner or later will touch almost everyone, sometimes profoundly. And connections, unfortunately, that are unknown to most of us. This is a story of coral reefs, cancers, and our society's addiction to based fuels. So my job as a professional ecologist is to find the connections in the world. And when, when I find one that's important to report it to society, it's my duty to report it to society, even if it's not something I particularly want to report. So what are the connections here between coral, cancer, and carbon? Let's start with coral. I am so blessed. I've studied coral reefs my entire career. They are just fabulously amazing. These are the rainforests of the sea, the greatest concentrations of species on this planet. They are colorful beyond belief. They are complex beyond belief. And I would love nothing more than to simply show you incredible pictures of incredible organisms for my time here. But I can't. So what I'm going to do is just give you a few, few snippets. I'm going to show you about three different species of fish that um, I think you may find interesting. I find them just to be totally fabulous. These little hovering dice are actually baby boxfish, less than an inch long, chasing each other with their transparent fins. That coloration warns predators that these things are toxic. This is a, another boxfish, um, an adult, um, reminds me of my Uncle Tony. <laughs> As you might guess, Uncle Tony has a bit of a drinking problem. <laughs> but this is the best. These are the frog fishes. See that thing waving in front of the fish? fish's face, that's a little fishing pole that's part of the fish's body. It lures fish nearby and suck, they suck them up in the fastest strike known in nature. Frog fishes are masters of disguise. All the little frills you see there on that fish are part of its body, not seaweed or something going on the fish. And you see that, that worm lure most of the frog fishes have lures that look sort of like worms or shrimp, but then there's this guy. If you look closely at that lure, you'll notice that it's like a little fish. It has eyes, it has fins, and this thing actually waves that thing in front of its face just like a little fish swimming. So imagine this. There's a fish on this planet that fishes for other fish <laughs> using a fishing lure that's a fish. So those are just a few examples of the amazing creatures that live on reefs. Reefs are just fantastic. But they're more than just complex and beautiful and fascinating. They also provide us many, many services. For those who live near coral reefs, they are a major source of food. Um, some nations get almost all their protein from reefs. They're also important as natural breakwaters, preventing storms, from eroding away coastlines. And they bring in billions of dollars of tourism, of course, for many nations around the world. But one way they affect everyone here, everyone in the United States, is that they're increasingly being found to be amazing sources of new medicines. Reef organisms, very humble organisms, produce chemicals that are fighting cancers and a variety of other diseases. Let me give you a few examples. This little crusty, white, cruddy-looking sea squirt has produced a, a uh, drug that only a pharmacist can pronounce that um, treats leukemia. Here's a little brown sponge that produces a new treatment for breast cancer. And another from a sea squirt that helps fight ovarian cancer. Just a few examples. These are all free gifts from nature for us. Free. And who hasn't been touched by cancer one way or another? I've lost members of my family. Just yesterday, 
I lost a dear friend and colleague to breast cancer. The coral reefs are giving us these gifts for free. They ask nothing in return from us. But unfortunately, and this is where things are going to go a little dark now, I have to report that we're losing the reefs rapidly, very rapidly. I've personally witnessed these incredible systems, one looking something like this, one day turn white as snow. The corals have lost their little single-celled algae that helped them grow, and that's why they lose their color and appear to be bleached. We call it coral bleaching. Through time, if the temperatures are too warm, and this is caused by a warming ocean, the corals die. They stand for a while as sort of pallid ghosts. You can imagine the trees of a forest all dying, and eventually they crumble. And all that's left is this, dead coral rubble with seaweed covering it. All that amazing life, most of it anyway, gone. And it's worse than that because the reefs aren't coming back particularly well because in addition to the oceans becoming warmer, they're acidifying. That means that the limestone skeletons of the corals cannot grow as well as they could in the past. And in future oceans, the ocean may actually become corrosive to their limestone skeletons. How bad is it? In the last few decades, we've lost about 20% of the reefs in the world. Reefs have cover less than 1% of the ocean surface. In the next couple decades, we're projected to lose another 20% if current trends continue, and by mid-century, another 20%. More than half the reefs in the world gone within a single human lifetime. These are conservative estimates. In fact, at the accelerating rate of warming that's taking place now, there are some projections that we may lose reefs as we know them by the end of this century. So this is where carbon comes into the equation. It's so hard to give this information graphically in a way that's easy to, to um, absorb. So just look at this figure. These are, this is all the water in the world, that droplet in the upper left, and all the air in the atmosphere, that balloon in the upper right. We think of the oceans and the atmosphere as being so huge, so vast, and they are compared to us as individuals. But in the grand scheme of the Earth, they're really not all that large. And what we're doing is dumping an incredible amount of carbon in the atmosphere every single year. In recent years, that's been about nine petagrams, but it's equivalent to the mass of over 26,000 Empire State Buildings, solid carbon, atomized into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Late end to end, those Empire State Buildings would run the distance from Cape Town to Scandinavia, or from California across the Pacific Ocean to China. Can seven billion people affect the atmosphere and the oceans? You betcha, absolutely, and it's happening. There's no doubt about this. So where does all that carbon go once it gets into the atmosphere? Well, it goes to three places. About a quarter to a third of it is it's absorbed directly by the oceans. Another quarter to a, a third is taken in by growing vegetation, trees. Thank goodness for trees growing around the world. The rest of it, a third to a half, ends up in the atmosphere, enhancing the greenhouse effect. As the atmosphere warms, so does the oceans. That's what's causing the corals to bleach. On top of that, the carbon dioxide absorbed in the seawater is acidifying the oceans, forming a weak acid. That's why the, oral, the corals can't grow as well as they used to be able to. So the corals are truly caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, the evil twins of ocean warming and acidification. So what are the connections here? And this is where things get a little strange for us because we don't think of our daily activities affecting reefs thousands of miles away. But the coral reefs are providing cures for cancer and other horrible diseases, but they're disappearing faster than we can screen the organisms for those wonderful drugs. Our overconsumption of fossil fuels and release of carbon is killing the corals, eliminating opportunities to cure these diseases that will face most of us in our lives. So where we are now is left with carbon and cancer, primarily. And unfortunately, we in the United States, per capita, per person, 
give off more carbon than any other nation in the world. Our total emissions are second only to China right now. So we can save coral reefs. We can stop climate change. It's all a matter of choice. We need to burn less fossil fuels. We can do that with just, without destroying our economy. Read Amory Lovin's new book, Reinventing Fire. More vegetation will absorb more carbon growing more trees, native vegetation especially, pulling that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And finally, for the reefs, we need to protect those that are left legally in fully protected reserves for future generations. There is no other way for the reefs. What can each of us do? Learn more and teach others, insist on teaching others. Get your information from reputable sources. Go to realclimate.org, climate science from climate scientists. Imagine that. The TV and radio per personalities are giving you false propaganda. They're not, you're not getting the truth from those sources. Simplify your life. You've already seen ways to do that. It's not that hard to do. We can have a wonderful standard of living without excessive carbon consumption. And third, vote, not just at the poll, poll booth, but vote by exposing the lies that we're getting about climate change. Read a couple books. Read a book called Merchants of Doubt, <laughs> Oreskes, Naomi Oreskes, and um, Sean Otto's Fool Me Twice. There's no other way here. So why am I really here? I'm here because I have children, and I love my children. This is my daughter and my son at my daughter's wedding. And I just learned very recently, along with the death of a colleague, that my daughter's expecting my first grandchild. I want my grandchildren and all your grandchildren to enjoy the same world we've benefited from. Not only the wonder and color and amazing creatures of coral reefs, but also the wonderful natural products that nature has given us that may end up saving ourselves and our loved ones' lives. Thank you.